Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for attending today's poetry workshop with award-winning author Ruth Awad. This event is funded by a Library Services and Technology Act, ARPA, outreach grant in support of diversity, equity, and inclusion at Columbus State, uh, the Columbus State Library. I'd like to thank the Columbus State Library's Nicole Rencher, Sharon Richter, and Dana Knott for help in producing and organizing today's workshop. Ruth Awad is a Lebanese American poet, a 2021 NEA Poetry Fellow, and the author of Set to Music a Wildfire, winner of the 2016 Michael Waters Poetry Prize and the 2018 Ohio Anna Book Award for Poetry. Alongside Rachel Menes, she is the co editor of The Familiar Wild on Dogs and Poetry. She is the recipient of a 2020 and 2016 Ohio Arts Council Individual Excellence Award and won the 2013 and 2012 Dorothy Sargent Rosenberg Poetry Prize and the 2011 Copper Nickel Poetry Contest. Her work appears in Poetry, Palma Day, The Believer, The New Republic, Pleiades, The Missouri Review, The Rumpus, and elsewhere. She has an MFA in Poetry from Southern Illinois University Carbondale, and she writes, lives and writes in Columbus, Ohio. In addition, Ruth has led and facilitated numerous poetry workshops, including the OSU Young Writers Workshop, Martha's Vineyard Institute of Creative Writing, Central New Mexico Community College, and elsewhere. So please help me in welcoming Ruth Awad to Columbus State Community College. Hi, everyone. It's so great to be here with you all today and to celebrate National Poetry Month. So thank you for taking time out of your afternoon to join us. Um, and thank you, Steve, and uh, everyone for having me here today. I'm really excited to, to nerd out about poetry with you all. Um, this workshop is designed to be interactive, so please do not just let me talk at you for the next hour. Uh, feel free to jump in with questions or comments. My hope is that we can just have a great conversation about poetry and generate some poems of our own during this time today. Um, so that said, I am a major dork and I put together a deck to guide us through some of the concepts that we will be looking at today. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. If you all could just let me know if you can see what I'm looking at, that would be helpful. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes, I can. Awesome. Thank you. Okay, I'm just going to switch to present mode. All right, so in our workshop today, we're going to be discussing the magic of the Volta. Uh, I love talking about Voltas because on at its heart, this is the most transformative element you can include in your poems. I would even argue that every good poem has a turn. Um, so this is not a literary device that is just limited to sonnets, which is the most context in which you encounter the concept of the Volta. Um, this is something that can be used in any type of poem, regardless of its form, and in any type of writing, really. So these are some of the things that we're going to cover today. Um, we're going to learn about what the Volta is, a little bit about its background, and how we can start to define different types of poetic turns. So that way we can later break the rules and ignore everything that I just taught you. Uh, we're also going to look at a couple of example poems to see how these voltas are being used in different types of forms. And then I'm going to lead you through a generative exercise where we're going to take what we learned about the volta and try to incorporate it into a poem that we're going to write today. We will have an opportunity to share or ask questions or a little bit of free time that we can kind of use however you all want to use it at the end of this workshop, but just wanted to give you a little preview into what we'll be getting into today. So as promised, let's talk about the Volta. Oh, by the way, apologies if you can hear my dogs barking in the background. They are downstairs, but their voices carry. Um, there's nothing I can do about that. Anyway, um, so as I mentioned, the Volta is a term 
for the turn in thought or emotion, usually in a sonnet, but as I already prefaced, the Volta can be used in any type of poem, regardless of its form. However, in uh, its most strict environment, the sonnet, you usually see it between the first uh, eight and seven lines in a Petrarchan sonnet, or before the final couplet in a Shakespearean sonnet. And just to make sure, I don't know like how much poetry background participants have, I'm just going to briefly go over those two different types of sonnets, just so that way we're all on the same footing. Um, but again, this is not a workshop about sonnets. This is focused on the Volta specifically. Uh, so I'm going to blitz through it. Apologies in advance. So um, the two major types of sonnets that you've probably learned about, if you've had any English classes in high school or undergrad, are the Shakespearean sonnet, which is 14 lines divided into three quatrains, which means four lines per stanza. And then it ends with a couplet. Um, for both Shakespearean and Petrarchan sonnets, they have a strict rhyme scheme and they are written in iambic pentameter, which is the kind of stereotypically bouncy rhythm that goes da-da, 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 unstressed and stressed syllables combined into one foot. Um, the Shakespearean rhyme scheme is, uh, I've listed it there, I'm not gonna go into it, but uh, that rhyme scheme is important for a strict Shakespearean sonnet. For the Petrarchan sonnet, it's 14 lines divided into two sections. The first is eight lines or an eight line stanza, which is called an octave. And the second one is a seven line stanza called a sestet. Uh, again, it has a rhyme scheme, also used at iambic pentameter. Uh, these are just some facts and figures in case you're curious. Uh, Shakespeare wrote 154 sonnets in his lifetime. There are 10 types of sonnets total, not including what we refer to contemporary sonnets as, which is essentially just 14 lines and kind of ignores iambic pentameter. Rhyme scheme is very fast and loose. A lot of times they don't use them at all. Um, but there's always a turn. A sonnet always has to have a turn. And again, I would argue that every poem has to have a turn, the Volta. So I think a great way to shape our understanding of the Volta is to take a look at this quote from Annie Finch, who is a really wonderful thinker when it comes to poetic craft. She says, how does the poem shape itself so that when one has finished reading, one feels the poem is over, that something has happened, that something has changed. I love to keep this quote in mind when I'm thinking about my own poems and my goal in writing them. I think that one of the powerful things we can do as poets is transport our readers, whether it's from one imaginative environment to another or from one feeling to another. Ultimately, our goal is to make sure that we take someone from point A to point B, just make sure that the poem has some semblance of journey. So, um, that is the entire point of the Volta. It can help structure the poem so that we can create that journey for the reader. So this is an overview of the different types of poetic turns that we can employ in our poems. Um, this is uh, at least seven of these are derived from uh, some excellent thought and perspective from the author Michael Thune, who wrote the craft book, Structure and Surprise, Engaging Poetic Turns. Um, it specifically discusses seven types of poetic turns. I don't think that anyone needs to memorize these to write good poems, don't get me wrong, but I think that it's helpful to have a language around different types of turns. So that way when we're analyzing poems or even reviewing and revising our own, we can kind of put definitions to the structural elements that we're deploying. Um, so I'm going to briefly go through these and then I wanna pause because I feel like I've just thrown a lot of information at folks. Uh, let's start with the emblematic turn. You'll often see this turn used in a poem that is centered around an object or even an animal. And usually the poem structure goes from a description of the object or animal to a meditative movement. 
that deepens our understanding of that object or tethers it to um, a memory or a connotation that deepens its resonance. This is, or these types of poems are usually written in two movements, two structures. Um, so it goes from, again, the description to more of the meditative element. An ironic turn uh, is one that begins with an assertion and then subverts the assertion. So the turn to subversion is the ironic turn. Um, Billy Collins uses this kind of turn a lot in his poems. He really likes to um, undercut a premise that he originally begins in his work. The retrospective to perspective turn is a poem that begins with reflection or looking backwards in time and then makes a move to looking toward the future. So the way to think about this turn is a shift in time. Uh, the plot twist turn is one that I threw in there. That's not Michael Thune's. Um, I think that this is really useful in narrative poems. And you can use this to um, reveal something new in the story that you're telling with that poem, or even reveal something about the character if it's more of a character study type of poem. Um, so that kind of turn is based on uh, plot elements and less like emotional leaps or time shifts. The elegiac turn, uh, while this one in its definition kind of centers on grief, I would argue you can expand this one to include uh, a stark emotional shift. So this kind of turn really encompasses moving from one established feeling or emotion to another established feeling or emotion um, in the example of grief, from grief to consolation, or you could go from grief to deeper grief, you know, there are no rules, do whatever you want. The concessional turn is uh, usually used in a poem that is more structured toward argument, uh, usually begins by admitting an argument or position's faults, and then making that argument or digging in its heels on that position anyway. Uh, it's a really interesting rhetorical move and can help move your audience from one understanding about a subject or feeling to another. The reflection to revelation turn um, is one where instead of like the retrospective perspective turn that looks in the past then looks toward the future, this one looks in the past or is um, meditating on a moment and then has a, a spark of realization, like the light bulb going off. And that is what this turn is all about. The dialectical turn, this uh, sounds really heady, but I promise you that it's a lot more intuitive in practice. Um, this goes from thesis, so the premise of the poem, to something that complicates that premise or challenges it in some way, and then ends up in kind of a middle ground between those two points. So think of it going from point A to point C and meeting in point B in the middle. And the last turn that I'll talk about before I pause is the descriptive meditative turn that changes a scene. Um, this one is different from the emblematic turn because it's not tied to an object in its description. Instead, it could be describing uh, a scene and then looking inward or taking a moment of meditative reflect reflection and then looking back at that scene and the scene has changed in some way. We'll take a look in a moment at an Ada Limon poem that does a really good job of this. Um, actually, a lot of her work employs that kind of turn. But I will, I'll pause there and uh, give you all a chance to ask any questions. And I know I threw a ton of information at you. Hi, this is Miriam. Can you hear me? Um, I have my... Uh, my gallery up in another screen, but go ahead. I can hear you. 
Um, <coughs> so a volta <coughs> is a change that happens and brings an element of surprise in a way. The volta? Yes. Yes, exactly. That is the entire point of the volta. It's to bring the unexpected into your work. And I think that uh, poets and thinkers talk about this in a lot of different ways. You'll hear folks refer to the imaginative imaginative leap, for example, or duende, but all of it's kind of getting at the same thing. It, it again, creates that journey, takes the reader somewhere unexpected. Um, and a lot of times we talk about the Volta as a really sharp, unexpected veering, but it doesn't always have to be. Voltas can be pretty subtle. And um, a lot of times, they can be used multiple times throughout a poem. We'll actually look at a couple of examples where there are multiple turns within a very short poem. Did that answer your question, Miriam? Thanks, Ruth. Thank you. Great question. Hi. Hi, how are you? Doing good. What's your name? Ruth. What's your name? Ruth? Mm -hmm. Ruth? Oh, okay. You look very beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> I've been having a hard time writing poems. I'm really not good at it. Okay. What do you think you struggle with? But I'm with good at poems? English. Huh? What is? What did you say? What's your struggle with writing poems, do you think? Um, writing poems, I'm, I'm, I'm not good at it. Rhyming is kind of hard. Okay. I love music, like listening to poems, music. I love English too. I'm also not good at reading. Um, I will say that you do not have to rhyme to write poems. In fact, the poems that we're going to look oh. at here in a minute, you don't have, they don't use rhymes. Um, and yeah, if that is the biggest hurdle for you in uh, beginning to write poems, just don't do it. Don't, don't stick to rhymes. I think that the most important part of creating and writing poems is that you are creating, again, that journey for your reader, that you're taking them from one point of being to another. So I would really focus on emotional resonance before anything else in poetry like devices are nice they can help uh, build the world of the poem but you don't have to use literary devices that don't serve you and rhyme is certainly one of those sometimes when my teacher told me to like make it rhyme it's kind of hard i was listening to music and poems it's like all very peaceful and calming relaxing Mm -hmm. And we are having a little bit of trouble hearing you. Um, and so it might just be the, the connection. Um, but we do have a question in the chat from Jay um, asking, um, <clears throat> how did you get started in poetry and creative writing in general before you got the MFA in poetry? Um, yeah, that's a great question. I. I've always been interested in poetry since I was a child because my mom got me into it. Um, this is a story I unfortunately tell a lot, but for my 12th birthday, my mom got me Sylvia Plath's Ariel. And even though I'm sure like I understood like a fraction of it, um, it like lit up my brain and my heart and made me want to try to do what Sylvia Plath was doing. Um, so yeah, I, I was interested in poetry from a very young age and I had the extreme fortune and privilege of working with teachers who cultivated that love and interest uh, with me. Um, my seventh grade teacher, Mr. Haney, used to actually create uh, my own assignments in English class 
um, and was teaching me how to write sonnets when I was in seventh grade. So, um, you know, nothing, no artist and no art is possible without community. And that's certainly been true for me and my creative path. We have one more question in the chat uh, from Gwendolyn and she's asking, or they are asking, um, a Volta in poems is analogous to conflict in larger written stories. Is that correct? It can be. Um, it depends on the type of Volta. Again, there are a lot of different types of Voltas. Um, some of them will have more of that stark veering that would be analogous to conflict in written stories or in novels, for example. But some of these turns that we're looking at here are a lot more subtle. It's a, a small shift in um, meditation or reflection or understanding of an environment. So it does not have to be like dramatic, you know, Michael Bay fireworks and stuff for it to be a turn. Um, it just has to, again, create that change from where the poem begins and where the poem ends. And there are a lot of, uh, as you can see on the screen, a lot of different tools that we can use to create that change. So I would, I would start thinking about Volta equals change. Hi, Ruth. It's Steve. Hi. Hey, here's a quick question. Um, I teach some non-Western lit courses. so. I'm wondering, is the Volta largely a Western tradition or does this turn up in poetry and other cultures and traditions outside of Western? Yeah, this, uh, this type of idea shows up in all types of poems. You can find poetic turns in haiku and haibun, um, in huzzles, uh, there's always a turn. Uh, in fact, in huzzles, the turn is toward the speaker naming uh, yourself in the poem at the end. And that is a, I think we can consider that a Volta as well. Um, and that is a poetic form that stems from the Persian region. So not, not specific to Western poetry has been popularized uh, again by sonnets, which are, uh, you know, Western-ish poetic form, but not restricted to those at all. Great, thank you. Great question. It looks like Anna has a question. Anna has a hand raised. Yes. Um, when I was reading kind of the bio to sign up for this poetry class, it mentioned that you were Lebanese American. And so I wanted to know how that is um, how that has influenced the poetry that you write. Um yeah, that's a great question. I think that while I resist being an ambassador for all <laughs> Lebanese American poetry, um, I'm certainly constantly inspired by Lebanese poets and Lebanese American poets. Um, and I write a lot about my family's history and my heritage and that informs my subject matter and the kind of craft choices that I make, I'm very interested in, um, you know, broadening our understanding of what it means to be an Arab poet. And if I can do like a little, little bit to chip away at that, I feel good about myself. Yeah, I love Arab people. They're good people. <laughs> You're from Lebanon? My dad's from Lebanon. I was oh, born. What about you? You were born here. I was born in the states. Yes. So you're Lebanese and American mix. Yes. Um. Hey Ruth, uh, this is Jeff Zentner. We've had the pleasure of meeting before. Um, I had a question for you. Will you be at some point sharing your favorite Volta from a poem during the, during your presentation? I would love to hear your favorite Volta if you've got one at hand. I do have some examples prepared. Um, actually, that's a great segue so that I can make sure that we have enough time to do our writing exercises too. Um, so I'll just move forward and we'll look at some examples. 
Also, hi, Jeff. It's good to see you. OK. Um, like I said, I love, love, love Ada Limon's poetry. And I think that she does such a brilliant job of reimagining the sonnet and its contemporary forms. Um, I'm not going to make you count lines, so I'll do it for you. This is a 14 line poem. Uh, I'm sure that some of you have maybe encountered this poem before, but uh, we'll just briefly take a look at this one and I will give us all the opportunity to guess where the Volta is. Um, I'll just go ahead and read it. Instructions on not giving up. More than the fuchsia funnels breaking out of the crabapple tree, more than the neighbor's almost obscene display of cherry limbs shoving their cotton candy colored blossoms to the slate sky of spring rains, it's the greening of the trees that really gets me. When all the shock of white and taffy, the world's baubles and trinkets leave the pavement strewn with the confetti of aftermath, the leaves come. Patient, plodding, a green skin growing over whatever winter did to us, a return to the strange idea of continuous living despite the mess of us, the hurt, the empty. Fine then, I'll take it, the trees seem to say, a new slick leaf unfurling like a fist to an open palm, I'll take it all. All right, so knowing what we know about the Volta, does anyone have a, a guess about where the turn in this poem might exist? I'll take a stab at it, Ruth. <laughs> All right. Um, for me, it seemed like things were slightly shifting uh, with the line patient plotting a green skin growing over and so forth. Kind of. I don't, I mean, it just seemed like that's when it went from description to kind of going into, I suppose, metaphor a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a great guess. And I can definitely see an argument for that. <laughs> I, there is, honestly, there's not right answers to this. I okay. have what, what I formulate as my opinion, but, you know, there's no, there's no like, yes or no when it comes to these kinds of things. Other ideas? So Jay in the chat says, uh, the leaves come. OK. Jay, do you want to, to talk a little bit about that? You don't have to. For me, it's fine then. That's where the tree, th that, well, that's, uh, that seems to be where the tree is acknowledging something more than organic process, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, that's where we see the tree sort of personified in a way that it's not personified previously in the poem. That's where we see the tree having uh, having a sort of consciousness that we can share. Does anyone agree with Jeff? I agree with Jeff. Yeah, that's where it seems to happen. I think that it might be line six where um, it goes from like greening of the trees and then it goes, that really gets to me because like that's sort of introducing the um, authors like experience and opinion sort of into it. Yep. Uh, as you can see, I gave away or I tipped my hand. I agree that it's the greening of the trees that invokes the speaker, at least as a Volta light for me, uh, a subtle Volta, because we do go from description to being in the speaker's direct point of view. And that's a foreshadowing for the bigger more stark turn that we get in the find then in uh, the third line from the end. And I think that, that that's a more stark turn because we go from mostly the, the description of the environment 
to a reflection that deepens our understanding and changes our understanding of this scene. Um, so it's both a structural shift, but it's also an emotional shift in the poem. Great work, everyone. Are you excited? Do you feel empowered to pick out Voltas and everything now? You don't have to. We'll look at another one. Um, so this is Mimesis by Fatty Judah, uh, one of my all time favorite poets. And I think that this poem does such a great job of embodying a really surprising Volta that carries so much weight and relevance for the moment we're in. Mimesis. My daughter wouldn't hurt a spider that had nested between her bicycle handles for two weeks. She waited until it left of its own accord. If you tear down the web, I said, it will simply know this isn't a place to call home and you'd get to go biking. She said, that's how others become refugees, isn't it? Um, guesses on where the Volta is in this poem. I think this one is a little bit easier than the Ada Limon one, a little bit more straightforward at least. It is a powerful poem, I agree. Nicole guesses the last stanza. I'm seeing some head nods from the folks on camera. Yes, that is the big shift in the poem. Because we go from the, this poem is a good example of an emblematic turn because we go from the description of mostly the spider and its home to the comparison to refugees, which takes the poem, uh, it expands our understanding of what home means and our, the hand that we might play consciously or unconsciously in the displacement of uh, other people, even animals, if we wanna take a narrow view of it. I've kind of mapped out the movements in this poem to illustrate how it does this work. It's a deceptively simple poem, I think. It's a very short, it doesn't seem to cover a lot of subject matter ground, but it covers so much emotional ground. And it does it by introducing us to these two main characters of the poem, the daughter and the spider. We get a description of the spider's home, which deepens our emotional attachment to the spider and its home, the web between the bicycle handles. And then we get the move that brings the speaker directly into the poem where I said to tear down the web. And then the last line that is the question from the daughter that embodies the turn of the poem and broadens our understanding of what it means to be a refugee and how we can take the metaphor of the spider being displaced from its web and the empathy that this poem has generated for that spider and its web and broaden it to our empathy for refugees in other countries and their displacement and perhaps our culpability in it. I know I threw a lot at you again, so I'll just pause and see if anyone has questions or responses. Okay, well, let's take a look at one more poem and then we'll get to some writing exercises. I adore this poem by Tommy Blount. Um, it's a complex poem. It covers a lot of emotional ground, but it's a great example of a poem that can have multiple turns. And these turns are not sharp, they're subtle, and they build on each other. And that's why I love teaching this poem as an example of how we can do this work in our own poems. The bug. Lands on my pretty man's forearm. Harmless. It isn't deadly at all. Makes his muscle flutter. The one that gets his hands to hold mine or ball into a fist or handle a gun. It's a ladybug or an Asian lady beetle everyone mistakes for a lady eating whatever it lands on. 
My pretty man is asleep, at ease or plodding like the bug. Or maybe the bug is a blowfly, eating my pretty man's tan from his pretty arm. My man swats it without walking, as if he's dreaming of an enemy or me. When my pretty man isn't asleep, he's got a temper. No, he is not asleep. He's wide awake and wants me to tell you I'm wrong. Blowflies don't eat skin, they lay eggs on skin. He knows all about blowfly larvae. Napoleon used them to clean war wounds. My cold, pretty man says in that pretty way with his cold, pretty mouth. He's eaten plenty of bugs before on night watch over there, over there, they're everywhere. Now, again, this is a poem that has several turns in it. So I would love for y'all to take a stab at where you think some of these turns exist in this poem. So Gwendolyn in the chat says, no, he is not asleep would be one. And then he has eaten plenty of bugs before would be the other one. Yeah, I think those are, those are definitely examples of some turns in this poem. Any other turns that you'll see? Or maybe the bug is a blowfly says Micah or me. It's a small moment of subversion, but it's the first hint that we get that this is not a pretty love poem, right? Even though the pretty man's forearm and the hand holding kind of sets up that expectation and the premise of the poem, it's almost immediately subverted with the ball into the fist or handle a gun, the immediate invocation of violence. Great. Um, so I'll give mine away. Uh, Gwendolyn, I think your point about he's eaten plenty of bugs before, that that's definitely a turn. Um, I marked on Night Watch over there, over there, they're everywhere as one of my turns because it deepens our understanding of the character and it gives us some reflection and background that can be connected back to the violence. So we read the violence as uh, maybe a PTSD response. And that is, I think, a moment of revelation. But I think the biggest, if we're going to pinpoint one of the biggest shifts in the poem, the biggest turn in the poem, it's definitely the no, he is not, because it brings the subject, the pretty man, directly into the poem so that he's talking through the speaker, which is a, a real structural shift for the poem, right? And it kind of embodies the, uh, the violent undercurrent of this relationship. We get a feeling that the speaker is being controlled by the pretty man because the pretty man is actually talking through the speaker, telling the speaker that he's wrong and making the speaker relay the pretty man's thoughts to us as an audience. It's a great poem. I hope you all liked it. Um, do we have any questions about that? Oh, and I mapped this out so we can kind of see some of the moves being made in this poem. So again, we go from that description of the bug and the pretty man, we get the subversion from the harmlessness and both the bug and the pretty man to a turn to violence. Um, we have the sharp turn with the negation with the no, um, the pretty man wants me to tell you this instead. 
And then we end the poem with that final turn, the revelation about the pretty man and his background, his history over there. All right, uh, in the interest of time, let's get to writing poems. I just wanted to share this Joy Harjo quote real quick uh, because I think it embodies the spirit of what we're talking about today. Nothing ever stays the same, whether it be poems or humans. Something to keep in the back of your mind when you're writing poems to make sure that your poems don't stay the same. Um, so here are some prompts for us to work on. I want us to take, uh, let's do the next 10 minutes to work on one of these prompts. I have them divided toward prompts that are geared toward getting you thinking about structural turns, that is like how the poem is actually set up versus uh, emotional turns, um, things that take the reader from one emotional experience to another. So I'll just read through these really quickly and then I will be quiet and we can work for 10 minutes and then we'll reconvene. Uh, your options are to create a poem that is a numbered list of facts. One of the lines must begin with a negation. So no, or, you know, he does not do this, blah. Uh, your second option is to describe a moment that's meaningful to you as specifically as possible, capture its sounds, textures, appearances, sense. After you've written that full description, I want you to actually begin writing the poem that will give the reader directions to this moment using your sensory details as landmarks. Or you could begin a poem with a headline pulled from today's news. At some point, shift to a future you don't yet know to imagine how the story resolves. You could also write a poem using only questions. This one seems hard. I might try this one. I want you to employ one of the, one of the turns we discussed earlier and make sure that your poem does not offer any answers, only questions. Uh, if you want to take a stab at the emblematic turn, like uh, the Fatty Judah poem, write a poem about an object or animal, include at least one detail that you didn't know until you researched that object or animal, and make a turn that challenges or changes the reader's initial understanding of the subject. And the last adventure that you can choose, write a love poem for something you dread, like climate change. Use an ironic turn to undercut or subvert your original assertion. Any questions? All right, let's write for 10 minutes. Hi, we do have a question in the chat from Gwendolyn asking um, if we should send our poems in the chat. Um, you can, you don't have to. We will have the opportunity to share our poems if you want to after our writing time is up. But if you'd rather not read it, you're welcome to drop it in the chat. Or you can just, you can also keep it to yourself. No pressure. I know that like, I don't like finish or I don't like sharing work that is uncooked. So I'm not gonna hold you to standards I wouldn't hold myself to. I don't know if you want to save the rest. We have one other question. I don't know if you'd rather save it um, until closer to the end, but Jay is asking um, for those who write as a hobby, are there any places in Columbus um, people can go to improve their skills? Um, Columbus is actually a great place to hone your craft as a writer. There are a lot of open mics here. Uh, I know Scott Woods hosts one at Cafe Kerouac, I think every Wednesday. Um, and that's a great place to be in community with other poets who are also working on refining and developing their craft. Um, there are little pop-up workshops like this through the universities around here. Um, getting plugged into the local bookstores is always a great place to meet other writers and authors. Uh, I love $2 Radio and Prologue. So are both great places to go talk to people who are obsessed with literature. Um, so just top of my head things. OK, 
Hey, Ruth, just uh, FYI on the time. My clock says we have about seven more minutes in the hour. Oops, okay. Um, well, let us move on from writing so that way we have a chance to share if anyone has something that they want to, um, or if no one wants to share, which again, you do not have to. We can open it up to questions from y'all. I'm happy to just talk about poems if you'd rather. I'll read mine, Ruth. Yeah, let's hear it. All right. Uh, I did the prompt uh, about climate change, a uh, love letter to something I dread, and I just did climate change. Awesome. Uh, men in bow ties say there are benefits to climate change, and I could be persuaded. Who doesn't love more warm days? Another month of summer, December stitched into autumn, February conscripted into spring. Who doesn't love water and why should the poles get to hoard it to themselves like dragons guarding mountains of gold? Water everywhere, cleaning us from the memory of the world. That takes off a lot of the pressure. That's amazing, thank you. <laughs> I can't believe you just wrote that in like the five minutes I gave you. Oh, Jeff, flexing on everyone. Hard act to follow, but does anyone else wanna share what they wrote? Anna? Sure. Um, it's not very good, but I'll share. Um, I never thought I'd come to this. Oh, and I did the um, prompt that was on like a personal experience that you've had. And unfortunately, I didn't get to the Volta or the turning point, but this is what I had. Okay. I never thought I'd come to this point. My heels sinking in the wet grass. I walked to my assigned seat with feelings of excitement and nervousness. I tightly grip the folder in my hand as I take my seat, sweaty palms creasing the thin folder in my hands. My eyes scan the crowd looking back at my parents. I can't believe I'm actually here. A woman soon walks to the podium. I shift in my seat nervously as I open my folder and reread the sheet. It's almost time to read the speech I've worked on for two weeks. Excellent. Oh, so you have a really strong premise there and it's really ripe for a turn or a shift. And I just I feel like it's on the cusp of it. So I'm really excited for you to keep working on that. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Did anyone else want to share? I could share. Please. Um, so it's called rats. Uh, what do you think of the rats in the New York sewer? They scurry around, they bite, they hold diseases. Did you know that the ones with spots are descendants of domesticated rats, ones used to warm homes and kind touches, left because we turned our eyes away? Domesticated animals do not thrive in the wild. They find the closest thing to what they know. Amazing, thank you. Thank you. I love the turn. Excellent. Um, Maybe we have time for one more, if anyone is brave and willing. No takers? I can go ahead and share, if you can hear me. I can hear you. OK. I chose the, um, the animal prompt as well. Excellent. So under the light of the pink moon, a rabbit leaps out from a nearby bush, eyes reflecting in the headlights. It realizes there is no harm. Sensation of tranquility washes over me, and yet I can't shake the feeling this is a warning. With eyes that see everything, I wonder why can't I? Excellent. Yeah, I love that turn at the end. It's kind of haunting. I'm so glad that you all managed to, to write something in the no time that I gave you. <laughs> um, and speaking of time in the interest of it, this is a, a quick list of resources and uh, poetry books that I recommend if you're interested in um, reading more about poetic turns or seeing examples of it. Dana Smith's Don't Call Us Dead has a crown of sonnets in the center of the collection. 
This is a brilliant example of interconnected sonnets and each one has really incredible turns. Um, I also included a couple craft books at the end if you are interested in like learning more about the, the thinky side of poetic turns. So um, yeah, I can also email this list so you don't have to like scurry to write this all down. Um, and I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so I can rejoin you all and open it up to any questions comments, concerns. Also happy to answer just general poetry or writing questions if you have them. I know we had a question earlier in the chat that was from Jay um, and it asked, what are your favorite literary <laughs> tools? Favorite literary tools. Um, definitely the Volta. Like I said, I think that it's just, it's an essential component in the poem and making a poem feel complete and making it feel emotionally resonant. Um, so that's definitely one that I think about all the time in my own poems. Um, but I'm also a real sucker for a simile. I don't know why I, I tend to gravitate towards similes over metaphors, but you know, I feel like a well-placed simile feels a little bit more accessible sometimes than a, a metaphor. Yes, I have a question. Yeah. How did you start to like writing poems? Like, how did you start to like writing poems? Um, so I think I touched on this a bit earlier, but my mom is a big, big fan of poetry. And so she kind of got me into reading poems early. Um, and it's just kind of been something that she had nurtured in me growing up and that my teachers also nurtured. Um, so yeah, that's what got me started. I just started reading poems that I really loved and then wanted to try them out on my own. Um, I see a question from Nicole. How do you begin creating a poem, free writing or journaling? Uh, I wish. I take notes in my notes app on my phone and that's about as much free writing as I do personally. <laughs> I, usually, I usually start a poem just by reading. I'll read poems or a book of poems and it will just like put me in the mood to start writing or I'll be walking my dogs and I'll get an idea or a voice for a poem in my head. And that's how I begin developing it. But it's rarely, I don't have like a, a diligent writing practice that I can share. It's a little haphazard, but um, yeah, I just try to keep feeding the, the creative well, either by reading stuff or just observing uh, my environment closely and having some faith that it's eventually going to show up in my poems when I sit down to write. Ruth, we are <laughs> right about at the top of the hour. Um, I've posted a web link to Ruth's web page in the chat if anyone is interested. And Sharon has also noted that we will be drawing prizes after the event. So please keep an eye on your email if, uh, that you use to register. See if you want any prizes. Um, I wanted to thank Ruth for this wonderful workshop today. I, I, it's been incredibly enlightening. Um, I'm terrible at poetry, but I feel like I'm taking away some wonderful, wonderful information and advice. And I hope everyone else feels the same. Again, I'd like to thank uh, Sharon and uh, Nicole and also Dana Knott for helping to produce this program. And uh, Ruth, if you have anything else uh, to say before we break? Just thank you all for being here and for participating. And it was a pleasure to talk about this stuff with you and I hope it was helpful. Thank you, this was great. I, would, I, I know we're virtual, but if we could give uh, Ruth a round of a virtual applause, <laughs> that would be wonderful. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone for attending today. Thank you everyone. Yeah, this was such a experience. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Lovely afternoon, everyone. This was Thank so you. fun. To the organizers. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm.